I guess so this is an official welcome on the Skills for Mars podcast. Well, thanks so much for having me. Good to be on Mars. Yeah, thank you as well for being here. And um, your book was amazing to read. I uh, oh, did finish it, but I can't say I read the others. And you're quite a prolific writer. I just copy and paste a bunch of things from Wikipedia <laughs> and no one's ever called me out on it. <laughs> so tell me, Vic, how did you get interested in all of this technology stuff? Oh, gosh, I was 12 years old when I got a Commodore 64. I know that totally dates me. And then I went to Carnegie Mellon for undergraduate school. And even the poets there know how to code, they say. And it's just been with me. And I remember when I worked in human resources out of grad school, and I was terrible at dealing with employee um, relations issues, but I was interested in systems and how are we tracking all this and data. So um, eventually after about 10 years of consulting on enterprise systems, I just had something in me that had to come out and it ultimately turned out to be my first book, Why New Systems Fail. And then I just enjoyed the process. I felt like I could improve as a writer. I had things to say. Um, plus, from a business point of view, there are only so many hours in a year you can consult. And I just thought it would be cool to keep it going. And you know, knock on wood, 11 books later, here I am. <laughs> did you ever have a talent for writing or did that evolve as you were writing the books? I, mean, I could look back at certain points in my life and say, okay, this was a good paper in high school or college, or, um, you know, I, I would write training manuals as a consultant on how to use applications. Not that anyone ever read them. They'd call up and say, how do we do this? Said, well, you know, it's on page 37, right? You know, of what? Um, but yeah, I, I read a lot, mostly nonfiction. And I think that it demystifies the process. Plus I've had some friends write some books. My, my friend, Scott Birkin has been an inspiration. I went to college with him. He wrote a bunch of well-regarded and best-selling books like The Myths of Innovation and The Year Without Pants about working at Automatic, the company behind WordPress. And when a good friend of yours does it, it doesn't make it a competition. It just demystifies it. Oh, okay. You're a smart guy. I like to think I'm not an idiot. Um, and you see the opportunities that it can present to folks. And there are worse ways to make a living. It can be frustrating at times, but uh, I think a smarter person than myself once said it's a hard way to make an easy living. Yep. <laughs> I wish I could uh, write. I mean, uh, yes, this, that's not my uh, strong point. Uh, asking questions I've done for a long time. So I guess that's something I enjoy doing and I'll keep doing it. <laughs> that's why we are here. Yeah. I, I like asking questions in the book. I don't have all the answers, certainly with regard to the new one. I mean, yeah, I, yes, I've got some opinions. I back them up with facts and data, but you know, the idea that I could write, anyone really could write a book that covers every conceivable dimension of collaboration, whether it's leadership or culture or technology or hiring or the, the, the changing world of work. Um, but I think that I presented an interesting framework that when taken with some of the other recommendations, um, will hopefully let organizations make the successful transition to hybrid or remote work because I, I and some of your other guests have mentioned this, we're not going back to a Monday through Friday, nine to five, you need to be here to work kind of environment, at least for the most part, there may be certain companies that require that for certain jobs. But, you know, I, the longer that we do this, the harder it is. I don't know about your neck of the woods, but at least the United States, people have gotten accustomed to a certain level of flexibility. They want to take their um, kids to soccer practice or pick up their um, child from school or, or just exercise in the middle of the day and they don't want to get up at six o'clock commute for two hours get home at eight be frustrated and you know as i'm fond of saying i think the work legacy of covid will be that before our personal lives revolved around work and now our work lives we want to revolve around our personal lives for sure and it's getting more and more uh, mixed that's um I think one of the items that I wanted to talk to you about, because even in, in the book, in uh, Reimagining Collaboration, you talk about the Calendly and all the calendar apps. And um, I frankly wanted maybe advice or maybe teaching someone who's, I really don't like to give up that control I of my you schedule. Don't. I do. That's one of the things that I really hold near and dear, the um, managing my own time. And I somehow feel that if I put that in an app and I allow anyone to just 
pick a time and a date, I'm not flexible anymore. For me, when I have an appointment, it's a promise. And 99.9% I'm there. I'm not perfect. There are times where things just happen. But otherwise, I'm 99%, 99.9% there. And I try to be there. For me, it's a promise. How do you... Why do you like them? <laughs> okay. Well, first up, I will tell you that you're not the only person. And, and I do mention that in the book. But I, this actually happened to me last week where I sent someone, someone my Calendly link... And the person says, yeah, I don't, I don't do that. Um, and I would say, well, what's the alternative to go back and forth with, you know, it's 7.30 here in the morning and where is it? 4.30 there in the afternoon, right? And then in the United States, there's daylight savings time. But of course, I'm in Arizona, so we don't celebrate that or believe in that. So uh, the alternative for me is going back and forth with a bunch of emails. And I just think there's a better way to do it because I, I do understand the power of technology um, you're right. In theory, anyone could make an appointment, but I give out my own Calendly link very um, selectively. Okay. And if you book something and you cancel it, I understand. But my general belief is that if you've canceled something two or three times, then maybe you, know, you shouldn't be on my podcast or I shouldn't be on yours. Um, so uh, I, I have found that those tools can facilitate a lot of the manual processes, they can automate them. And automation is a really big theme in reimagining collaboration. If you look at companies like Zapier, IFTT, AirSlate, and a bunch of others, right? I mean, the idea that we're sending email attachments back and forth is insane. They just had the Zapier annual conference. And the way you can automate things without having to code is remarkable to me, right? If I post something on my website, could that be an automatic tweet or a post to LinkedIn? Sure. You know, if someone fills out a form on a website, could that be an entry into a CRM like Salesforce? Absolutely. So if you look at some of the data around employees feeling overwhelmed, which is a real problem in the United States and other countries, uh, Asana launched a study, I want to say three or four months ago, that something like 30% of the time employees are working on work. In other words, they're trying to find a document, they're trying to schedule something, they're trying to coordinate something that's not as enjoyable as writing good copy or creating a podcast, hopefully, or editing a video, something that takes, quite frankly, more skill than searching WhatsApp for the message and then email and then Teams and then Slack. Something that can pull you in and where you can be fully in. Otherwise, administrative tasks are not necessarily funny for the most of us, I think. Some people enjoy them. I'm a big believer in flow and Mikhail Csikszentmihalyi, I think, just passed away a few days ago at the age of 84. Yep. And I mean, his book was one of the best I've ever read. This notion for the listeners who don't know of him, who are practicing a sport or a musical instrument or writing a book or just, as you said, working, you know, it doesn't have to suck. But if we're constantly being interrupted by notifications in our collaboration hub, if we're constantly doing manual work or creating a document, a template, when one already exists, I, I just think we can do a lot better and work can become less stressful, more meaningful, but we're going to have to change the way we do things. I would argue that the way we were working wasn't really working before the pandemic and the notion that these pointless meetings that could have been five minute messages or asynchronous videos will just replicate in Zoom. Well, that doesn't make any sense. Um, so you know, how can we use this crisis as an opportunity? And I would argue that you know, technology can play an important role. It won't solve all the problems because if your culture is dysfunctional or your business processes are largely manual and, and they don't really reliably work, well, then you know, using Slack may not solve all your problems. But I really wanted to write a holistic book about collaboration. And uh, even there was an interesting study I saw a couple of months ago, uh, Microsoft worked with a company uh, called Beasley that something like 41% of employees uh, say that um, the notif I'm sorry, the number of workplace applications overwhelms them. And what if you could stitch them together into something that was a, a lot more cohesive? That's where the idea of the hub comes, uh, comes in for sure. And I'm 
100 and uh, plus percent with you. I think that's definitely the future. So you'd have no uh, argument with he me here. <laughs> so, <laughs> and we are fully, we are fully aligned. But Phil, you are an expert in collaboration technology and in collaboration. And we are talking about flow. How does collaboration look in flow? How would that ideal collaboration look like? A lot of the companies, and I know Darren Murph talked about this when he was on um, your pod. I think he did anyway. I've watched a bunch of his interviews. Uh, this notion of breaking the workday up into manager time versus maker time. So if you're a creative person, right, you want to dedicate all of your afternoon to building something versus, all right, I got to check my messages in Slack or email or Teams or whatever. Um, now, it, it is interesting to me when you look at some of the collab, collab um, work technologies, say Canva or Figma. I mean, Figma, it's got something like a five or $10 billion valuation. This notion that you are collaborating with people, you're designing with other people, right? On almost a virtual whiteboard, right? Imagine that just working a lot better than, you know, um, you know sending pictures back and forth or getting on a Zoom call. And the, you know, I think Mural is one of the apps that people can use within Zoom to create kind of a virtual whiteboard in Microsoft Teams also lets you use a whiteboard, but you know, Figma is specifically designed, so it's best of breed. And this is why designers absolutely love it. Or Canva, I can invite someone to my Canva workspace or even tools like um, for some of the graphics or you know, FizzMe, a similar type of thing. So um, we actually can be collaborative remotely. Now, do I think that we'll ever get to a point at which a brainstorming session or we'll reach the best possible state remotely. I, I, I don't want to say never, but I'm skeptical because I do think that there's a certain magic that takes place. I think about some of the online training courses that I've conducted in my career when people actually figured things out for themselves. I don't know if that would have happened if it were remote because their dog's barking or someone rings the doorbell, right? Or they've got all these other applications pinging them. Um, but I, I mean, even a Spotify playlist, we can make collaborative, right? In fact, I had on um, April uh, Rene, who wrote a book called Flux about the changing nature of the world. And um, she created a playlist with well, songs that had the word change or flux in them, right? So the David Bowie song or the Fishbone song or whatever, and you can make that collaborative. So, um, you know, you've got certain applications like Google Sheets or Google Docs that enable that type of collaboration. Um, but it's tough to get into flow if you leave Slack open with your notifications or teams or you're constantly checking email or your phone. So in his book, Csikszentmihalyi, and I think I'm pronouncing that right, it took me years to get his name right, recommends just leaving all of that off. And I think that's that's great advice. But I think the challenge is if you are collaborating, um, someone could distract you. Um, so that's why I think it's incumbent upon organizations to invest in the training, right? Well, a lot of times... I'll explain to folks when they say, yeah, I hate, I hate that woodpecker noise in Slack. Go, Why? It distracts me. I go, well, you know, you can A, quit Slack. You can B, mute channels and people. Or C, you can just hit do not disturb mode and you won't get this. Oh, I didn't know that. Right. And I think that many times it's management not investing in the training. They expect people to figure it out. But if people are already overwhelmed, it's almost a chicken and egg problem. Right. How do I figure out the best way to use the application when I don't have any time? Or the last thing I want to do is learn because I'm fried. In fact, I had a, an interaction with an executive at a company who wanted to do some Zoom training. And I wrote Zoom for dummies, so hopefully I know what I'm talking about. And it was for healthcare. It was for a bunch of nurses. And he said, all right, I want to do one hour of Zoom training, Microsoft Teams, and a bunch of other products in an hour. And I said, no one can talk that fast. Right? That's not going to work. And then he finally landed on, you know what, I'll just buy some copies of Zoom for Dummies. Now I'm happy that he's buying copies of my book. But if you think that nurses after the end of a 12 hour day in the middle of a pandemic are going to pick up my book and learn how to use an application, you're out of your mind. 100%. This is funny when you talk about why systems fail. This is one of the big issues why systems fails. And I need a book as well. Maybe maybe I, I missed some of the lines, but I, to me, it comes back to the human. And at, and at this point, I believe that the tools are good enough to support collaboration. Oh, absolutely. 
I mean, my, my first book, Why New Systems Fail, is largely about people. Yes, there were instances in which an application did not work. There was a bug. But was it because somebody did test something, right? Was it because they loaded bad data? They blew off training? They didn't document the business process right? Yeah, I, I would argue that all my books at some level are about people. Even you know, some of the more technical books like Too Big to Ignore, Too Big to Ignore the Business Case for Big Data, a large part of understanding how to take advantage of these new sources of data is recognizing that you can't put a ton of unstructured data into a relational database. It just isn't built for that. So, you know, or the age of the platform, you know, any company can launch a quote unquote platform. But if you look at what Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google have done, um, both good and bad, they've, they've taken some risks that some companies wouldn't in the case of Amazon. Um, so yeah, I, I like to think of myself as almost an accidental technologist. Um, if I were to write a career path for my, for anyone like me, I would never recommend getting a master's in industrial and labor relations and starting to work in human resources, but I've sort of embraced it. it. Particularly now, if you look at some of the labor unrest taking place across the United States and other countries in the world, it means whether it's strikes or walkouts or um, people just frustrated and not going back to work and the unemployment rate so high, um, you know, I know a little bit about that because of my background. So I, I have, I think, a, a different one than most technology writers. What do you think the state of collaboration is right now? In terms of the actual collaboration, but also in terms of technology? All right. So the pandemic forced us to adopt these tools, but just because we adopt them doesn't mean that we're doing anywhere near what we could. The, the central premise of reimagining collaboration is that we are just scratching the surface of what these tools can do. So I haven't seen user data from Slack or Microsoft Teams. Now, Microsoft will say that 145 million people use Teams. That's great. I would be shocked if they use it for anything more than email replacement, when in fact with Teams, you can do so much more in and of itself, much less when you start to link these third-party apps or the use of Microsoft's equivalent to Zapier is um, Power or Automator. I think they've re rebranded it a few times. So if someone sends you, say, an email, you could automatically forward that to Teams, right? If um, someone books, uh, so we were talking before about Calendly, Microsoft has a similar tool called, uh, I think it's called Find Appointment or something like that. I tried it. It's a little clunky, but Cal, um, some of the uh, tools for booking time, the free versions have too many ads. It's something like find a find appointment, but um, it's conceptually very similar because it has access to your calendar. So if I had a guess, I'd say that you know, maybe 10% of organizations have embraced the hub spoke model. And I, I talk about a few of them in the book, but there's so much opportunity. And these tools, I think, will continue to improve but unless people, to your point, change the way they look at things, change business processes, change performance management, um, I don't think that they're going to get as much as they can out of these tools. And as a result, play that out. More employees will be frustrated. More employees will leave. Um, you'll waste more time trying to find the same document. And then towards the end of the book, I really geek out. If you think about AI and machine learning, and I'm no expert, but they're all based on training it on data. The sooner your companies use these tools, the better the AI will be. So I envision a future kind of like that movie. I don't know if you saw it, Her, with Joaquin Phoenix about the guy who falls in love with the operating system. Okay, it's worth checking out. But he winds up falling in love with a computer program because it knows exactly what he needs when he needs it, right? When does he need compassion? When does he need a kick in the ass, right? Um I see something similar happening with collaboration hubs, right? If I'm managing a bunch of employees and my hub tells me that, um, you know, I don't know, um, Darren is not as engaged, right? That's a good thing for me to know before he turns in his resignation letter, right? Or which employees need training. And there's so much potential for these hubs. The sooner that organizations embrace them, I think the better position they'll be down the road. So there, I would argue, are short-term as well as long-term benefits of embracing the hub-spoke model. Um, working against that, though, is the simple fact that people hate change. Yeah, we don't really like it. Or we are very, very slow to change and understand the benefits of uh, adopting a new thing. But let's have an exercise of imagination. Because uh, I think it's, if we 
show the rest of the world what really embracing collaboration would look like and what would be the benefits, maybe the adoption would be would be higher of the hubs and just increasing this as a skill in, in general. So okay. right now we're scratching the surface, right? We are at the 10% uh, usage of uh, hubs. Like with communication and stress management, we are really not good at collaboration or yeah, we're scratching the surface there as a skill, as an individual skill. What if we would get 50% adoption of, of, of these hubs or 100% adoption? What would this do to the way we collaborate with each other? With or without yeah. the hubs? How And how would that look like? Yeah, well, I think the hubs are essential. But if, if you look at someone like Jeffrey Moore, who wrote Crossing the Chasm and lays out this adoption um, graph or model, you know, there are the early adopters, right? There are the small people at the beginning, the small numbers of people that just understand what these things can do. That's one of the reasons I wrote this book fairly quickly. Um, I knew I'm not that smart. Eventually, other people will kind of glom onto this idea. And I didn't want to write the 15th book about collaboration hubs and spokes. Once more people do it, more people do it, right? It's basically a network effect, right? So imagine a company that collaborates really well. Employees might even work only four days a week or there's less stress, right? They have, um, you know, they, they don't go away for vacation and come back and have a thousand messages in their inbox or Slack notifications or whatever. Um, it sounds like a place most people would want to work for, right? Where they could be, to your point from before, more in a flow state. Their business processes are largely automated, right? They're not copying and pasting data into multiple systems. They're not searching for things in mul multiple applications or systems. I, I don't know about you, but I get excited talking about that because uh, I've been saying this my entire career, work does not have to suck. And to your point from before, I, I do agree with you that the collaboration technologies have gotten much, much better and they'll continue to do so. So this is why, again, tying back to what you said before, this is why I have such a hard time going back and forth with email, knowing there's a better tool out there. I'm, I'm fond of saying it's like going for a, a, a run outside with a disc man, right? When you've got an Apple watch or an, you know, a smartphone or whatever, why would you bring a disc man? Yes, it will play music, but it only holds one CD. It's, it's clunky, right? It's going to skip. The batteries are going to die when you can listen to music in a, such a better way. Um, so I, I, for one, would like to work in that kind of company. And again, if, without any other information, I would think that that company would have a competitive edge over organizations that rely on antiquated technology and, and manual business process and work just isn't fun. Right. I mean, I'm a big believer that people want to accomplish certain things. They don't want to spend their days searching for documents, uh, sending a bunch of emails, constantly uh, playing whack-a-mole. Right. What if you did have time to actually think and create? And yes, there's an administrative component. I don't see that going away. But what if instead of 60 or 70 percent of your job, what if it were just 10 or 20? I mean, that, that to me sounds like a better place to work. Can you imagine get, gaining all that time uh, back? Maybe at that point I can use Calendly as well. And But I was thinking as well, if we get to the point where we use these hubs really well and we see the benefits and we start enjoying work and we start enjoying work with each other, how much this would actually help us evolve and increase in terms of trust, the relationships we have with each other, maybe even emotional intelligence, because I think the moment you introduce technology, it helps you as well because it, because it automates certain things, but it also starts changing some, something about yourself. And ideally, it would help you evolve in a certain way. Yeah, we could go down a very long road there, especially with what's going on with Netflix and Dave Chappelle. Uh, the, you're right. The, these collaboration hubs will increase transparency. Say what you will about email. You could always forward an email to someone or copy someone on the wrong email, right? We've all had that happen. But these collaboration hubs are by definition quasi-public forums, right? You can create private channels and still have discussions, but technically the company owns that, right? So if you're um, putting up racist images, if you're slandering a colleague, um, the same we do resources. with email as well. I mean, it's right. still a company. Yeah. Right. It's so, but it's easier it's, to see in a hub for sure. Sure. And, and this idea that you can lock it down. I mean, you know, you could take pictures of screen, you could take screenshots. There's so many ways. I mean, if, 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 when Slack will close a private channel, I'm sorry, when Netflix will cl close a private Slack channel, 
because employees are having inappropriate discussions. They could just text, they could use WhatsApp, they can get Discord going. So, um, but I, I think that you should lean into that because if you've got that problem, I would much rather know about it so I could address it rather than not. And then a bunch of employees leave or there's a lawsuit, but you're absolutely right. It does increase the transparency of what's going on. But I would argue that, you know, email is never completely private either. Right. I mean, you could, you could do whatever you want with that message. And even if you could completely lock things down, what would be the downside of that? Would you be inhibiting legitimate communication or collaboration among employees? Again, these are big questions. I don't have all the answers, but I think that it was important to write a book that you know, laid a foundation, but also made people think about things differently. And quite frankly, I don't have all the answers. I can't tell you how a healthcare organization should handle a privacy issue um, in Denmark, right? Or the United States. I mean, th there's, there's no way you could create a flow chart like that but hopefully the model of the book is sound and the questions that I raise are valid. And when people read it, they will, as I said, try to reimagine collaboration. Um, we were talking about gaining access to information and having more transparency. And one of the questions that I had was about knowledge transfer. Is it right now, the knowledge that's shared through email or even voice, everything is pretty much lost, right? This is one of the issues organizations are really battling with. Um, or employees uh, leave, they retire, and that transfer of knowledge doesn't happen. Did you see cases in which hubs were used and organizations actually managed to extract the knowledge from those hubs so that there's not a lot of loss there? Yeah, a couple things. First, the short answer is yes, because again, if you're absolutely right, if the head of marketing leaves and the organization relied upon email, then yes, if he or she emailed other people, then in their inboxes, you've got the decisions, the documents, the discussions, whatever. But still email <laughs> and inboxes will, will go away when those other employees leave. Right. And they're not in a place. I mean, imagine joining a company and the first thing you get is 50 forwarded emails from all the previous. That's just not you're already overwhelmed. Right. With your benefits and your paperwork and all that. So I, these hubs can do amazing things in and of themselves. But then there are tools like, say, Get Guru, which I would call a spoke, a tool that you could attach to Teams or Slack or other collaboration hubs. And then they could create these knowledge cards in the cases of get in the case of get guru right so if you join an organization you say oh, okay here's you know a document or an entity that tells me what i need to know about this policy or whatever or if you look at what what darren did at gitlab right with the you know 14,000 pages of documentation on, i mean that's an incredibly useful tool far more useful than email so or what Microsoft's doing with, um, I think they might've rebranded it, but something called Project Cortex and the technology that would go through all of the communications in an organization and then create almost like a, an internal wiki that other people could access in the clickable links. But then Microsoft now is calling it, I think, like, um, Project Viva that connects everything in the world on Teams. So Teams is almost your operating system and everything interacts through Teams. So you're absolutely right. The potential for that in terms of knowledge transfer is fantastic, not just in avoiding having to answer a question because it's already there, but the implicit knowledge, right? The thing, you know, and, and Slack's got analytics. I know Microsoft, and Google, uh, Workplace by Facebook, similar types of tools. They could help you answer questions that you didn't think to ask. And that kind of blows my mind because again, if I'm a manager, why wouldn't I want to know that my team is less engaged or that a certain employee is acting in an inappropriate way? Not because that person used a certain word, right? Maybe in a channel or in a meeting, the white guys are dominating the conversation, right? Maybe that would be a good thing for me to know. So you're right. It is all connected. The transparency, the knowledge transfer. Um, I just think that these tools are so much more powerful and an email is fine. I like getting emails for a speaking gig or book sales or whatever. But if I'm going to engage in a project with someone, I, I, I don't want a hundred emails in my inbox. I just, you know, I actually did a ghostwriting project about a year and a half ago and it didn't work out. But because we did it in Slack, I said, look, here's the workspace. All of our communications are back just because I'm leaving the project doesn't mean that 
anything from me goes anywhere. So the next person you find as a ghostwriter can jump in and see everything that took place. To me, that's such an incredible time saver versus, yeah, I don't know, he, he sent me an email with an attachment, but I can't find it, right? This is everything in one place, boom, transfer the rights, everything's there, good luck. I, I think at some point we, and even now, we mistake uh, email as a, uh, for a messenger tool. And it's a mix of everything. Yeah, it's a Swiss army knife, right? I mean, you know, yes, it's got a screwdriver, but it's probably not as good as a proper screwdriver if you're, you know, fixing something around the house or it's got a, a, a bottle opener, right? And it'll get the job done. But no, I, I, I agree. And yeah, Marshall McLuhan famously said, the medium is the message. I think a lot about that. There's a formality to email. Um, Slack doesn't really just as one example, have that, right? In some case, it's too far. I mean, could you imagine someone sending you an email with an animated GIF or an emoji, right? But in, in Slack or Teams or Zoom, if someone makes a good point in a public setting, then it's completely right, appropriate to do thumbs up emoji or put in an animated GIF. You would, if, if you sent someone an email with that, that person would justifiably be angry. Why are you cluttering my inbox with this crap? Right? It's, it's maybe I'm on a phone and it's a big animated GIF and it's taking a while to download. I waited 30 seconds so I could see you know, a cat walking around. Are you crazy? So yeah, I, I think it's high time that we embrace these tools because they're, they're very easy to use. Yes, you, for some of the more advanced features, some training is useful, but come on, what does the at symbol do? What does the hashtag do? I mean, we've been on social networks now for what, 15 years? A lot of this stuff is very intuitive. And even connecting some of the spokes I mentioned before, Get Guru, you don't have to have IT you know, code, right? You connect it through the API, you authenticate, and boom, all of a sudden now you have an extension of that hub, right? You don't have to go, oh, is it in Slack or is it in Get Guru? Well, it's the same thing, right? You access one from the other. And then it, everything kind of coalesces into this one single gestalt. And to me, it's just a better way to run your business and not having 16 different sources of information. Maybe it will get more and more uh, adopted as people play computer games. And they are, at this point, most of them are connected through hubs or you can access them through a hub. Yeah, it's, it's, it's possible. I mean, it, I'm not a big gamer myself. I think there's something, uh, I don't want to offend anyone who happens to play video games, but I think for a, a man my age to be a big gamer would be a bit odd. But, you know, if that's if that's something you enjoy, then I'm not going to judge. We all have our, uh, we all have our hobbies. But yeah, I mean... It, the, the hub model, they, they already implemented it quite a few years ago and it works really nicely. I mean, it's extremely easy to do anything related to gaming. Okay, I will take your word for it. I'm not, I used to be a big gamer right now. I, I still play every now and again when I have time just to relax, but uh, their hubs are, are pretty impressive. And um, the adoption of them was extremely easy. Maybe also because people, when they go to play computer games, they go there on their own initiative and no one forces uh, a new communication or collaboration tool on them. And it's just, yeah, they learn how to use it because they want to, and they want to be in contact with their friends and they want to see them on video or chat or while they play the, the games. So, um. no, and there's, there's a lot of truth to that. I think it was the management theorist or writer, Peter Sange, who said that people hate change unless it's their idea. So I can understand how in some organizations they use Slack in one part, they use Teams in another part. The organization makes the decision to go with one, let's say it's Teams. The Slack folks are going to be unhappy, even though they are similar tools. And truth be told, I prefer Slack to Teams. I think Slack is the best communicate, um, collaboration hub out there for a bunch of reasons. But I can see why some people would get annoyed um, because they didn't have any choice in it. But look, I still think that Teams uh, is a far better tool than, than email. And um, you know, if I have to use Teams with a client, so be it. I just I, I do not like going back and forth with a bunch of emails because so many things get lost in translation. I like knowing that for a project, I can go to one place and everything is there, right? As opposed to searching for a document or a message in six different places. I just, I think that's insane. But you consult with companies. So I'm curious, how many apps do you have to use and how many different emails, email addresses? I try to use just one email address, but for apps, oh gosh. Um, I mean, I use Slack, Teams, Zoom, Basecamp, Rike, which just got acquired by Citrix. You know, Google Docs, in fact, in the book, I think I list about 
30 different apps that I use for different purposes. And I started to think that I was special until um, Okta released a study not that long ago that I want to say that the tech companies use the most apps, but even non-tech companies of a medium size used about a 150 apps or services. And that could be everything from DocuSign to a CRM like Salesforce or an ERP like Workday, you know, certainly Microsoft Office, those tools. So you know, to your point, this notion that we can use one or two tools, I think is insane. I was tweeting at a few folks a few, a few days ago about how we just need this one app that does everything. Well, good luck with that. That's just impossible, right? There's no way. I mean, even if you look at Google Sheets, which is great, it could do some cool things. It can't necessarily do everything that Microsoft Excel can do. And Excel, which is a very powerful tool when it comes to data visualization, doesn't do everything that Tableau does because Tableau really specializes in that. Now Salesforce owns that too. So yes, that can be a little overwhelming, but in a way, so when I know that, for example, there's an app in Slack called Donut that lets two colleagues meet with the people randomly, right? Just like you're in the hallway, right? To grab a donut. Well, Google Meet, which is part of Google Workspace, they've done a terrible job with branding, constantly changing it, actually has that same feature. So once you've used a lot of these tools, you say, all right, well, I can do this in Slack. I'm sure I could do something similar in one of these other tools. Um, you know, if I'm using Trello for project management versus Basecamp, or if I'm using Asana, um, they all have their bells and whistles, but you know it's not like the idea of a Kanban board is foreign to the folks in Todoist, right? You can set up a Kanban board, right? But Todoist to me is a better app than Microsoft To Do, and Microsoft has something like six different productivity apps. It's very confusing. In fact, I had a guy on my own podcast, uh, Matt Wade, who wrote the user's guide or to learning Microsoft Teams visually. And he created this Microsoft um, periodic table of the elements with all the different tools, kind of like in chemistry. And I knew most of them, but I certainly didn't know all of them. Um, so I'm a big believer in picking a lane. If your organization embraces the HubSpoke model, great. What, let's start with your hub, right? I don't want to hear we use Slack and Teams and Facebook Workplace and Google Workspace, right? Where does all of your communication take place, right? And I don't want to hear, well, we use six different tools for project management. You can, but even a tool like Reich, which again, Citrix brought, um, announced before the acquisition that they were working on artificial intelligence and machine learning, which again is based on data. So if we're using Reich to manage our projects, imagine if, yes, I can see the status of any particular task, but imagine if the organization over the course of the year conducted hundreds of projects and thousands of tasks, could I see which days were the least productive? Yes. Could it tell me, yes, you're putting two weeks for this training, but historically it's taken everyone a month, right? These are all things that the technology can recommend to you to manage your workplace better. But if you've got everything um, bifurcated into a bunch of different applications, then you're limiting that. For sure. And it's, it's hard to reconnect them. While you were talking, I was thinking actually of two questions related to organizational design. And this is uh, so quite a big audience of my podcast of Skills for Mars comes from the organizational design space. So the first question was related to informal networks and this uh, hubs. Do you think do any of them have the capability today to map an informal network of communication and collaboration? Do you know anything like that? Out of the box, I don't believe so, but I, I, I believe that there are third party tools or apps that you can use for that. In fact, I had a guy on my podcast who wrote a book about uh, collaboration. I forget his name. It's early here, so apologies. Uh, but he did exactly that thing. He was able to create almost a social graph um, but, but a work graph, and you could see how people would communicate with each other. Um, if that doesn't happen out of the box, uh, I guarantee you someone's working on it. And the implications of that to me are fascinating. Think about this, right? You've got an entry-level analyst making $50,000 or euros a year, and that person gets an offer for 20% more. And in many organizations, that's the end of the conversation, right? We can't pay you anymore. Well, what if you knew that that person actually interacted with everyone and was so much more valuable, right? You could actually see how that person was constantly solving problems and um, answering questions and was just really valuable beyond the, 
Exactly, exactly. So do you want that person to leave? Um, maybe, maybe not, but I would much rather have that information in making the decision about whether to counter the offer than to just say, yeah, see ya, we'll get another analyst. Because that person might, and then what characteristics does that person exhibit? Is that person inquisitive? Is that person curious? Is that person you know, tech savvy? Is that person constantly doing things on the side apart from her job? I, I'm no expert in organizational design, but why wouldn't you want to have, Seth Godin calls these folks linchpins, right? These are essential folks in your network. And I can imagine how, and I've, I've even seen this in my consulting days. I, I'd say, all right, you know, my company is going to put me on another project and I've documented everything, right? Good luck. I kid you not. I'm on the golf course and the phone rings. <laughs> and so it's just, yeah, we can't find this. Um, so, you know, I'm happy to help my, my clients, but imagine if someone, you know, just leaves and is unavailable or doesn't return calls. Um, so, yes, I, I think that's an enormous benefit of these types of things. And this gets to this whole notion of innovation, right? Slack, Microsoft Teams, Zoom, no company can do everything. And because of the APIs and the SDKs, you know, third party developers can create incredibly useful tools. I mean, Slack funds companies, there's something called the Slack fund. Say, so we know we can't do everything. Right. What can you do to make our collaboration tool that much more useful? And sometimes Slack will buy it. Slack bought a directory company a while ago. You know, Microsoft's made a ton of acquisitions, diddle for Google, diddle for Zoom. Um, but this isn't just about getting bought out. It's about taking the core technology or product in interesting directions. And to me, uh, that is so much more interesting and powerful than when someone says, oh, yeah, our company built the equivalent of Slack. I said, no, it hasn't. <laughs> you do not have you know, 2000 people working on something for five years and a third party community doing interesting that you just don't. The only company I've heard of that did anything remotely like that is called Click Health in Canada. And I profiled them in my 2015 book, Message Not Received. And at the time Slack was out, but it had a small adoption rate. And this company had spent 15 years replacing email with um, I think they called it Genome, but it was an internal operating system for the organization. Um, and it was really impressive. But yeah, the idea that give your IT department three months and they'll build the equivalent of Slack, I think is insane. It is. Im yeah, I've, I've seen the tried and uh, it always fails because they put something together, but it never works if they manage to put anything together. Um, I do have the, the second question about um, uh, org design or related to org design. But do you know about the um, Slack spoke uh, called Kona? I don't. I don't. What's that? It's uh, actually. I think uh, Darren uh, actually helped them uh, while they defined the uh, they defined their product. Uh, it's an app that looks at the personality and emotional intelligence of the people. So really reading through text. Right, oh, they have really, really sound research behind. And then uh, if, for example, we work together and we are remote and we have a performance evaluation, then uh, Kona will tell you, hey, Julia likes uh, direct uh, feedback instead of uh, something that uh, is, is placed as a sandwich. And uh, she's really quick to act on this and this and this. So um, it's, very, it's very nice connecting people with each other and letting them know how the other person feels, especially when they are remote. That's fascinating. It sounds a little bit like sentiment analysis, right? So you're reading not just the words, but the meaning behind them, right? And I know the companies like IBM have done, yeah, yeah. So certain people might use different words to describe their emotions, or even certain adverbs might convey a stronger emotion, right? How are you today, Yulia? Oh, I'm good. Versus, oh, I'm very good, right? Oh, okay. Um, so, but you know, um, I don't know a ton about it, but I'll, I'll have to check that out. And again, that to me is. Um, an interesting application of Slack's core technology, but in and of itself, historically, before hubs and spokes, you might have a third-party tool that wouldn't necessarily integrate, integrate with the ERP. Uh, but now you have that, and, and you think about those things working together, right? Imagine if that were tied into a, a calendar app or a performance management tool. Um, the other question I'd have, though, is do you want to be giving a performance review remotely? particularly if it's a bad one, right? Maybe that is but the type of thing. But for all remote companies, I don't think they have any option, no. right? So they have to do it remotely. And it's better to do it remotely than not at all. Oh, absolutely. I'm just saying that to me, one of the best 
reasons to get people together up if possible, which isn't always the case. You know, I'd hate for my manager. You ever see that movie Up in the Air with George Clooney, right? I'd hate to get fired over, you know, over Skype. <laughs> Yeah, that happened a lot at the start of uh, COVID and the lockdown. I mean, people were complaining like crazy about that. Yeah, Not even that, because managers didn't even know how to say that. So they sent an email and maybe just called them and said, yeah, you're out. And that was it. <laughs> it's interesting that you mentioned that. I was just reading an article about how turnover among HR execs, I think, had doubled or something during the pandemic and 70% of them reported feeling overwhelmed because you know, they were just getting leaned on so much. I'm sure in part to questions like this, how do I let someone go remotely, right? Well, how do I cover myself? I mean, uh, it's an, I'd say this, it's an interesting time to be an HR person and the technology could certainly help. And just to come full circle, as we talked about at the beginning, imagine if I had more time to devote to that and by doing a one hour call with a manager, I didn't check Slack or email and have 47 new messages about things that were in a knowledge base or um, a policy or, you know, what time works for you. And a bunch of people are chiming in. I could do six. No, I can't do six. I can do seven. No, I could do eight. So maybe it would take that to get you to embrace you know, Calendly and some of the other tools, because if you saw six or seven messages, uh, Doodle's the one I was mentioning before. Um, in which people can effectively vote on the time that works for them. And if not everyone's on the same calendar system, something like that is invaluable. I know we used that when I was a college professor at Arizona State because they realized that trying to get everyone to coordinate schedules for an inter um, a someone interviewing for a professor job was just impossible. Doodle is awesome, I think, but it, they're very, very old. I think I first used them... 2007, 2008? Am I wrong to say that? Yeah, it, it, it's not a new tool. I, I, I don't know exactly the year, but I, I think it's at least a decade old. It is It is definitely old. Yeah, it's, it is definitely valuable. And I do like to use someone else's Calendly. <laughs> okay. That's uh, for sure extremely, extremely easy. So I never say no to that. I still have a hard time making my own. I have started, I have, I have a Calendly address and everything, but I'm still uh, yeah, holding on to my time. <laughs> yeah, but at least you're willing to use them. Um, I, I, I could tell you that I, uh, I've definitely run into people who flat out would use that tool. And I, I just think it's insane. As I write in the book, there's this example that the guy was from LinkedIn Learning. He just wouldn't use the tool. And I'm thinking to myself, all right, so you want me to tell you four times that work for me, but by the time you get back to me, three of those times may not work. So I'm supposed to hold four one hour slots for you, which is really kind of ridiculous, right? Uh, I, you know, again, if I said you had to sign up for an account for something, all right, maybe I could understand the friction there because security or inconvenience. But I mean, if you can operate a mouse, <laughs> you could book time with me. So I just, yeah, to, to me, the excuses for not using it are quite frankly, lame. Uh, and, you know, it just, if you didn't, if there, you didn't know of a better way, then hopefully uh, reimagining collaboration will open people up to new ways of thinking. Um, you know, I didn't want to write another guide, you know, Slack for dummies, Zoom for dummies. Those things are already dated and they're not even two years old because technology changes so quickly. Uh, but hopefully this is a conceptual book that will hold up for a few years. Second question about organizations and related to org design. You were talking about formality while using email and maybe even informality when using Slack or Teams and, and so on. Do you think this is driving organizations which are less hierarchical because of that? Or maybe hubs works better in organizations that are less hierarchical and are adopted easier? That's an interesting question. Um, I, I would argue that if IBM with 350,000 employees can use Slack, then what's stopping a 20 person law firm, right? This notion that these collaboration hubs only work for small hip startups with a certain number of people. You know, do I think all things equal that a flatter organization may be a, le a little less bureaucratic, a little less political? Sure. But, you know, there are plenty of large organizations that understand that even though some folks might resist using these tools, um, the benefits far outweigh the costs. 
So uh, to me, IBM is I, and one of my former clients. Um, I don't want to say bureaucratic, but uh, you know, they're not a, a particularly nimble organization um, and they pay for Slack, right? They didn't build their own tool. They didn't go with Microsoft Teams because I'm sure they use Microsoft um, Office 365 and Teams as a part of that. But they said this tool is worth paying for, right? Because it lets us do all these things. And even if we are hierarchical, is this a tool that like makes us less hierarchical? And what is the benefit of that? I don't have the answer, but you know, in the case of IBM, you know, they're and also ran in cloud computing, which is kind of crazy if you think about it, right? The company's name stands for International Business Machines. Why is it that Amazon and Google, um, Microsoft with Azure, are far ahead? Right? Maybe if they were less hierarchical, they could have responded better and they wouldn't be where they are. I, I don't know. Yeah, this uh, they are newer companies as well. So I guess they learned from the mistakes of others also. That's, that's yeah, also you, possible. You hit on an interesting point, and that's the notion of greenfield versus what I'll call brownfield. Right? So you're starting a company, you have this unique opportunity to say, here's how we're going to do things. And it's so much easier to say, we're going to be using Slack from this point forward. And if you don't like it, right, when we hire you, goodbye, because this is how we do it versus the organization, whether it's IBM or any other mature one that has been using email for internal communication and quote unquote collaboration for decades. Well, you're going to find plenty of folks who say, ain't broke, don't fix it, right? I'm a VP making $300,000 a year and I just got a great performance review and I had a good quarter. So leave me alone. Um, I, I I do think that that is a wrinkle that is tougher for more mature organizations to solve. Um, but that doesn't mean that you know, it's unsolvable. I mean, we, we've, you're right. Fundamentally, I think this book is about change management and it is very difficult, but hopefully people will understand that, you know, maybe not everyone will, will be there, right? Because it is important to get everyone using these tools. It is important to get everyone to thinking, to start thinking differently. And if they don't, then you know, there are real consequences, right? I mean, you don't want to be a successful company, you know, 10 years later now on the outside looking in, you, know, you want to re remain nimble. And particularly as employees have so many choices with respect to where to work, right? It doesn't matter that you don't offer remote work or hybrid work. Plenty of other companies are. So how do you retain employees in this environment? Again, technology is not the only answer, but it's a big part of it. And if we use technology well, Right? And you can take a vacation and enjoy it. And you're not inundated with messages throughout the day. and You're not feeling overwhelmed. Yeah, to me, that's a source of competitive advantage. Maybe I'm wrong. It doesn't mean that you're going to work at a place in which you're underpaid and your boss is an asshole, but you've got slack. But if I have two choices and they're equal in every regard, but one tool embraces hubs and spokes, I would rather work at that company than the other one in which I'm constantly playing whack-a-mole with my inbox. I think that says something about the people working there as well. Their adoption of uh, this uh, type of technologies where they actually make it easier for everyone to talk, communicate, collaborate, get things done versus just sitting in front of change and doing nothing or just ignoring or even even uh, saying uh, no, to, no to change. But I also think things will change because you have people already in high school working with this kind of commu communication and collaboration tools. Right, so they're already coming educated. University for sure. Professors start using it. Uh, then you go to different companies. Some of them use them, some of them not. But you already know the benefits of collaboration tools from your previous encounter with them. It's so funny that you mentioned that, Yulia. At Arizona State, where I was a professor, I was one of the very first professors in the entire school to use Slack, and I used it with my students. They'd email me. I'd say, "We, I don't do email." And that's why um, my publisher reached out and asked if I wanted to write Slack for Dummies. Um, I insisted upon using that tool with them because I knew that many of them would use it. But many of my colleagues, in fact, most resisted using Slack. In fact, I write about this in the book as and you're nodding your head. Um, I tried to get my department to use Slack in lieu of email because to me it was insane that we'd send out a department-wide email, but it really only applied to tenure trope tenure track faculty. Well, why do I care? Right? Why, why isn't that in a channel? Why can't I mute that channel or leave that channel? Instead, I'm wasting, call it five seconds of my time, right? Multiply that by however many professors, multiply that by however many emails, 
right? That is time that I'm better spent preparing my course, holding student office hours. Absolutely. Um, but the decisions, uh, the decision to use Slack in the classroom was mine. So I could force them. I couldn't force my, co I couldn't tell the department chair, my boss. Yeah, I don't do email, dude. But I could tell my students that. So there is getting back to this notion with with Calendly, there is absolutely this, for lack of a better term, power dynamic involved, right? Are we using your tool or my tool? It's when two executives argue about using WebEx versus Zoom, right? And that's why it, it's fascinating, but it's also frustrating because ultimately, who cares, right? Either one is better than using email or either one is better than, you know, I, I don't know, using an inferior video tool. But no, it's... Uh, I, I, I started my own podcast and have really enjoyed being on other people's podcasts like this one on Mars because so many people could take the book in so many different directions. And you have questions about org design. I don't think I've answered too many questions on other podcasts or interviews about the topic. So I, I, it's fascinating to me. To, and then plus you're, you're in Europe and the United States and there are different laws and norms. I mean, I know, you know, they tend to have a better work-life balance in Europe compared to the United States. We we brag about how much we work and how little sleep we get. Um, or even from my understanding is in certain countries like Norway and Sweden, if you say, what do you do? You would say, oh, I like to ski or I like to play football. Well, here in the United States, when you say, what do you do? They say, oh, I'm in marketing, right? It's just a very different way of answering that question. For sure. For sure. And it still is here as well in Europe. When someone asks you, what do you do? You usually talk about work. Okay. Now, Sweden, Norway, and Denmark, they are very special cases in Europe as well. They're way more okay. advanced uh, towards uh, yeah, life balance and just enjoying life more, way more advanced on that path. But I think we're on an evolution pathway towards uh, better collaboration as well. And uh, this period that we've just been through is just uh, pushing this Quite, yes. uh, quite hard, which is, which is very good. I mean, uh, we have managed to make steps that we have not been able to make for a long time. One last question, Phil. 50 years from now, if we do embrace the hub models, how would they evolve and how would collaboration evolve? What do you see if you have a, if you'd have a crystal ball? Yeah, I think it'll look a lot like that movie I mentioned before, Her. Right. So I, and towards the end of the book, I mentioned how, you know, you're going to go for a run in the morning, but the hub notifies you that you have an urgent issue. Right. And not because someone put urgent in a message. Right. It, it, it's got um, the ability to figure out what's really important to you. Um, you wouldn't even necessarily need to use a tool like Calendly because it would this is, you know, the, the technology behind it, especially the AI would know, you know the right times for you to meet with folks. Right. Or you wouldn't necessarily have to block off your calendar because it you would it would guide you in the direction of getting what Cal Newport would call deep work done. Um, I, I do still, still think that there will be email because you'll need a way to communicate externally with folks. But I think it'll be much less pronounced. Slack's got a tool called Slack Connect. But even in Microsoft Teams, you can invite guests to channels or teams or workspaces. Um, so I, I, if I had a guess, we'll see a gradual shift towards more communication in these hubs. Uh, and then I think about voice translation and recognition. We were talking before about Alexa. I think you'll be able to ask the hub questions. You know, what do I need to know today? Right. You maybe be able to talk to it. Right. Or if I'm doing a, a having a meeting with someone in China and you could already get some of this with otter.ai, if you've ever heard of that tool, in theory, the meeting could take place in one language and be available in any language transcribed and totally searchable, right? So you wouldn't have to watch 20 videos to find when the CEO has said something important, right? You would just type it in or speak it, or maybe even who knows, think it. Uh, I think it's going to be really exciting to see how these tools evolve because prior to the pandemic, you know, Slack, Zoom, Microsoft Teams were growing, but certainly not at this rate. And as smart, smarter people than myself have said, uh, the pandemic really accelerated trends that were already taking place, whether it's e-commerce or remote work or telemedicine or online education. Uh, the pandemic just supercharged that. So beyond that, I'd just be guessing because I'll leave you with one of my favorite quotes from the physicist Niels Bohr. Predictions are difficult, especially about the future. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, well said. Where can people find your book? Reimagining Collaboration. 
pretty much everywhere. Um, there are some samples on my website or excerpts, um, on philsimon.com. But Yulia, thank you for having me. I've enjoyed being on Mars. Thank you as well for being here. I have enjoyed this conversation very much. For those who want to reach out, LinkedIn is the best or through your website. Yeah, website works. And there are icons there for everything, whether it's Medium or Spotify or uh, Patreon, or I, I, I lose track of all the different. It's 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 a full time job working for yourself. Just there's always more that you can do, and long gone are the days in which you can say, "All right, I'm just going to be active on my website." Now you have to post the videos on YouTube. And I'm not on TikTok. I'm, I'm not on Facebook, but I've got plenty of other ways for people to find out about my madness. Thank you so much, Phil, for today. <laughs>